Are you ready to learn about the property market? Then you're in the right place. This is Everything Property by Pivotal Homes, where we connect Australia's best developers, agents, home buyer specialists, wealth creation experts, and property advisors to the people of Australia. Broadcasted from Whitehorse Studios on the Gold Coast. And now, here are your hosts, Hayden Ashton and Tom Egan. G'day listeners and viewers right across the country. Welcome to Everything Property by Pivotal Homes, where we connect Australia's best developers, agents, home buyer specialists, wealth creation experts, and property advisors to the people of Australia. Now, today's guest has worked for some of Australia's largest and most successful developers. He is going to share with us a stack of information about land subdivision and townhouse development. And of of course, share his views on the Queensland property market today. He has been involved in the sale and or development of over 4,000 properties in South East Queensland, has decades of experience in construction, property and sales. He is the current National Sales Manager of MG Homes. Paul Bloomfield, welcome to the show, mate. Thank you, Hayden. Good to be here. Hello, Tom. Hey, buddy. Hey, mate. Um... Really appreciate you coming on in, in what I'd imagine a very busy schedule and uh, plenty of plenty of activity in the market uh, marketplace. So we really appreciate you taking the time to, to come and have a chat mm. to us about everything property, as the name suggests. Uh, mate, first and foremost, what I'd like to do, uh, we're in um, uh, probably 15 or 16 episodes and we've sort of like to start the conversation by giving the people watching uh, and listening, of course, on Spotify and whatnot, um, some context around your journey personally into property, um, how you came to be involved uh, in in the property industry or, or in financial services um but also mg homes you're the national sales manager of um of such a great organization there and, and what you guys do specifically and how that business has evolved and transformed over its life life stage as well sure thanks for that i uh kicked off my journey having graduated from high school and i accepted a cadetship into chartered accounting yeah right yeah that was in melbourne and i studied part-time and I worked full-time and I did that for a number of years until I came to the conclusion that I wanted to be a little bit more Mm outward-facing. So the natural progression from there, Hayden, was to financial planning. Financial planning, did that, really enjoyed it. I found my number one objection was, Paul, that's a great idea. Can we do something with property instead Mm. of shares? We don't really like shares. Uh, From there, mate, I jumped into real estate. Real estate led to land marketing. Mm -hmm. Uh, specifically LJ Hooker Land Marketing, and I was looking after uh, some Stockland residential communities. Mm -hmm. At that point, Stockland decided to internalise their sales force, and they offered me an opportunity to jump on board. So Stocklands used to have all external? That was it. Oh, right, okay. So me being in industry, everything's internal now at Stockland, Mm -hmm. so it's all I know. So they used to just develop and have LJ Hooker Land Marketing as their sales avenue. That was it. Okay. I think they also built homes originally, didn't they? Oh, I'm not sure, Tom, to be honest. Yeah, I remember yeah. someone said back when they originally started, something they'd done as well. Mm. Perhaps in Sydney. Yeah, mm. right. yeah, down south it was, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, yeah sorry. Uh, so from there, started with Stockland. Yep. Over that five-year journey, or that was a 10-year journey, my number one wholesale partner was MG Homes. Mm. So at the end of my Stockland journey, um, they offered me a position and I accepted that. That was eight years ago. At that point, we were a house and land builder, similar to what you guys do now. Mm. Been doing that at that point for about 19 years. And then six years ago, we transitioned into uh, townhouse development, specifically to tackle housing affordability. Mm. And that's um, it's a really good point. And we, we really want to delve into that housing affordability and the difference between um, house and land and, uh, and, and townhouses shortly. But so you, you, you're a qualified accountant? Correct. You seem to be funny. Yeah. <laughs> You're not as dry. <laughs> no. Well, that's actually what happened. I, I, was, I was stuck in an accounting career, yeah. ironically enough, yeah. uh, because a recession hit. Yeah, right. So this was early 90s, mm. and I think I said to you before, off camera and off mic, that yeah. I was earning, uh, during high school, I was earning more uh, doing three shifts a week at McDonald's yeah, right. than when I went into the accounting field as a cadet. So, so was when, this like 91 or something like that, is it? 90? This was uh, 89 graduated high school and yep. jumped in February 1990. Yeah, right. So when the firm had to make a lot of redundancies, they certainly weren't getting rid of me, mate, because I was costing them about $12,000 a year. Yeah, right, okay. So I hung on to that for as long as the mm. economy allowed me to. Mm. And then once, once we got through that original 
recession or, or the 90s recession, the one we had to have, according to Paul Keating, mm. then I could I could move on. Love accounting, everything about it, just very challenging to do it eight hours a day. Yeah, yeah, I can yeah. imagine. And, and do you, did you find um, that you just mentioned accounting and then financial planning, has that served you well to go into property in terms of understanding maybe the numbers and the dynamics of the, of the financial services side that goes along with, with investing? Yeah, every component. So from a property investment point of view, personally, having got educated in that space, that mm. made immediate sense to me. Um, and as an accountant, and this is a large accounting firm in mm. Melbourne, uh, we were suggesting to our clients that they negatively gear residential property as a mm. way to get ahead. So nothing's really changed there. Mm. I understood that then. I understand it now. Uh, the channel partners I work with, there are various ways of promoting that. I understand mm. that. Working with MGH as far as feasibility studies go for mm. um, developments, I understand that. Mm. Um, accounting is invaluable, honestly, and mm. then to move it into the financial planning world and do it one-on-one -on -one and help other people understand it gives you a great appreciation of the gap in their knowledge. Yeah. Yeah, mate. And um, so you mentioned there the, the 90s recession, the one that we had to have, and obviously your experience and you've been around um, the property um, space now for a couple of decades. What, you know, we're in, we're in a crisis, you know, as, yeah. as people keep talking about in, in the COVID-19. Using back, you know, if you look back at the cycles that you've seen, you've probably seen a fair few now yeah. across your time. Yeah. Where does this sort of? I know it's hard to make comparison directly because it's so different in relation to it's not a GFC, you know, it's a it's a it's a pandemic and whatnot. But what's your gut feel on 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 the property market now? Um, you know, in the last quarter of twenty twenty, and and what do you think's in store for us in twenty twenty one? What I'm seeing, and everyone's seeing it, so mm. it's 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 n Melbourne and Sydney. Uh, just heaps of people are moving up here. Yeah. I think once upon a time, um, it it wasn't feasible to work from home. Mm. It was a big challenge. You thought that would be nice, but then it's all been forced upon us. We had to do it. Um, people have discovered that they can do it. Mm. Employers have decided that, yeah, okay, their employees can do it and they're not necessarily leaving. They're not any less productive. There's no There's no issues there. My understanding now, it, well, through what you and mm. I do, we both know that Melbourne and Sydney buyers are moving up here left, right and centre. In droves. <laughs> like I read an article the, yesterday, I think, in the ABC. Um, yeah, here it is. An ABC article did. And so the places like Bundaberg and, and even like um, the Sunshine Coast, but even closer to Brisbane, like the Moreton Bay and, and Ipswiches and, and, uh, and Springfields and that, people are just from down south seeing like, what? Fuck, 450,000. Mm. Well, I'll just take that sight unseen because that fucking makes sense. Yeah. When they're, you know, they're living out at, you know, I don't know, Mernda or something in Melbourne and they're paying six fifty, and they're in a, you know, shoebox. Yeah. I mean, all this cash buffers for them as well. Yeah. Oh. Okay, I can sell my place for 700 if I own it outright because they had such huge growth there as well if they've paid it down. Come up here, I can buy the house outright for 450 and have 250 300 depending on what they've got left over. Left, that's no-brainer for them. It's also a desirable place to live. Mm, so mm. we're looking at all the stimulus at the moment, particularly with buying a house or building a house. Mm. So all of a sudden in Melbourne, you've got no AFL, you've got no hospitality scene, weather's always been poor. People are looking around and going, okay, well, this place actually isn't that flash. Mm. Um, and it's not that easy. Population dynamics, there's a lot of people there now yeah. and it's, it's just hard work. I grew up there and it was a pretty cool place. In Sydney, people are going, great, I've got all these incentives to buy my first house, but where am I going to do that? I'm going to do that in a place that I don't want to live. And mm. trying to find somewhere sub-750 to get these Well, this, is, this so is, so is the thing. So you go out, yeah. out, mm. out and go, great news, I qualify to build my first home, but I don't want to live here and I don't want to raise a family here. So then you get to what you're talking about, Tom, and all of a sudden you have desirable real estate, places where you want to live, you want to raise a family, and you got an amount of money in the bank account mm. as your cash buffer, which is making you feel pretty good about yourself right about now because mm. a lot of people didn't have that have cash buffer. No. Yeah. And they've been caught out. They've been generously um, subsidised with mortgage mm. holidays and things like that. That's going to end. Um, but, yeah, this is the place to be. Mm. And I have relatives and friends in Melbourne and, and they're doing it really, really tough, especially mm. with what's been announced recently. 
over the last couple of days. They're just not coming out of this thing. Yeah, yeah. And I, thought, I was speaking to a couple of, I've got a couple of partners down there and they're not like, they're not having, I mean, they're still having 10 to 15, you know, cases a day, but they're still not sort of having any um, uh, release of the, of the, the, the martial law almost that's, that's in place down they're there. They're not they're reducing the stages. Yeah. They're keeping them high. Yeah. yeah. Daniel Andrews has basically yeah. said, if you can do this, we'll do that. But the, this bit mm. isn't happening and probably appears to be unachievable. Now what's happening is they're all essentially trying to say, let's work towards having a normal Christmas. And that's looking increasingly unlikely. Mm. And as I said before, there was, there's a movement uh, towards obviously working from home and mm. doing it well. And people are now doing that. So your employer of choice at the moment, it's, it's now a talent war where I can, I can um, attract talent by saying, I don't care where you work or mm. where you live. I just need you to do this job. And if you're um, an alternative employment opportunity and they mandate that you need to be in the office or you have to you know, drive for an hour and a half or show your face or something like that, you're probably going to go the other way. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and in South East Queensland, what's that mean? You're going to walk out in your backyard because you have a backyard, Tom, mm. because mm. you can afford... To have a backyard. To have a backyard. Mm. And be, you know, five minutes from the beach. Five <laughs> minutes from the beach, yeah. yeah. Or you're going to be yeah. surrounded by parkland yeah. and you're going to be able to raise kids in sunshine and mm. all those kinds of things. So, yeah, a number of friends of mine are real estate agents within a 5K radius of the Brisbane CBD. They're doing unbelievable numbers, just, yeah. just crazy numbers. Their marketing strategies have changed. So instead of a few photos and, you know, 60 words of copy, it's probably 30 to 40 photos. Mm. A YouTube video with the vendor explaining the features and benefits of the property and probably closer to 400 words of text um, yeah. to allow people to buy sight unseen. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, um, you know, the, these sort of events, they tend to, they don't, that, I, I believe it hasn't changed the world. It's just sped up what was already happening. Mm. You know, like people were already wanting to work from home pre-COVID and there was already a small trend to start that was starting to happen. But that's now sped up. You know, uh, shops and offices and, and that sort of stuff were already going – and or retail centres were already going online and now mm. that's sped that up. So I think we've all we've, all this has done is just sped up the inevitable anyway and probably for the better. Uh, mm. Because it's it had, it's it's reduced that lag or that slow, you know, period whereby fifty percent of the population do it, fifty percent of the do, uh, don't, and we're going to see a mass a mass change. And further to your question, what does the property market look like in two thousand and twenty one? Mm. Obviously, I don't have a crystal ball, but like many people reading the summary of the recent budget, federal mm. budget. Mm. With very few exceptions, I think every part of the economy has been not only stimulated but heavily stimulated. Yeah. I think the path to consumer confidence, particularly in South East Queensland, um, will be rapid. Well, yeah. they described the budget um, as the most significant since World War Two. I think, was the, was, was the lot of the media and headlines around it. And they made it – Frydenberg had a big push and, and it was evident on, on jobs and the, the way out of this – um, you know, recession was job creation, and it's certainly, you know, certainly a positive budget to, to achieve achieve some, you know, some important infrastructure projects. And and I think that'll, you know, that's not just for this budget, but we'll continue to see that because it's not as if we're going to wake up on the first of January twenty twenty one and be like, well, that was done, yeah. good, we got through that. You know, this is going to be something that takes, uh, the, you know, the work of, of of you know several probably governments um, to to get through, you know, what what we've had to get through in terms of you know, economic pressure and, and stimulus and what and pay back some of the debt. But certainly on a really, really positive note and compared to where other countries are in the world, it's um, we've done it, you know, the, the current government but also the Australian people have done a phenomenal job in, in navigating what is a, you know, unforeseen and, and, you know, just extreme set of circumstances. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. And when you compare it to the recession of the early 90s mm. where you didn't get that government assistance... Yeah, right. It was pretty brutal. You know, you lost your job and, you know, you struggled and maybe you recovered, maybe you didn't, whereas, mm. uh, yeah, certainly the government's helped everyone out. Yeah. So and yeah. I think there's been, you know, concern raised since the budget was released about the Home Builders Grant being extended or not and going, OK, we're we walking into the first quarter of next year being slow and quiet. But at the end of the day in South East Queensland, there's still a lot of good reasons to buy. Still really good value. You've got the low deposit... Um, scheme that's just been extended with yep. another 10,000 allocations. Yep. That's been raised in, I think it's 650,000 mm. that you can now purchase in. So there's 
two huge opportunities for buyers to go ahead and buy next year if the home builder is not there. I, yeah, I, I think a lot of people are freaking out about it. But in South East Queensland, you can still buy a really good house, 500000 the land's here, yeah. and we're still seeing people buy. So I don't think it's, it's going to drop and significantly for people to be worried. And you're spot on. Like, you know, banks are doing 95% LVRs. The reality is you, do, you don't need 25000 You need, you know, anyway, you're still getting the 15 fed, uh, state, state grant. Um, and plus, you, you know, I, I don't want to touch on it too quickly yet, but the responsible lending laws in, in March, that's a, you know, that's a game changer for, 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 the, for the industry. And so, yeah. you know, I think, and we touched, you touched on it quickly, but, you know, we, if, we've, if we rewind where, you know, six months ago, Every paper you pick up, a property market's going to crash by 30% and the world was going to end and anyone who invested in property was a mug because you've just lost, you know, lost everything. But now those people um, who said those things, those media, you know, media, you know, experts or whatever, have egg on their face because it, 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 both the, the, the existing residential market and the new housing market um, going ballistic, going, going, going bang, gangbusters. And if you look at back historically... James Fitzgerald from JLF, we had him on a couple of weeks ago and he took us through some data um, in relation to what house price growth was achieved in, in you know, the 92 um, crash and um, Black Friday or whatever it was, Black Saturday in 87 and then the GFC. Post those events, we had, you know, astronomical price growth of, you know, in excess of 50%. So it's certainly looking looking that way. And then, you know, if you look at the rental yields, the rental market's as hot as it's ever been mm. in the last, you know, 12, 18 months and things are renting for almost overnight, $20 more, yields are going up. Yes, investors have been a little bit shy in terms of entering the market over the last six months, but now on the back of the owner-occupiers just pushing and pushing and pushing, demand or supply is not there. Demand is incre- incredibly high. Yields are incredibly high. So from an investor standpoint, I'm seeing them start to enter the market because, hey, it just makes sense. And they're paying more than what they had two, three yeah. months ago if they entered the market. The investors are trying to get in, but there's just such a huge demand on the retail side. And the developers are looking at it, well, we're obviously going to sell it to the owner-occupiers, going to spend a lot more on their home. And now they're missing out on the opportunity in the estate. New stage releases come out, like an area that Hayden sold in the sunny coast, they released the next stage price list <coughs> that's just come available, and I think it was like 35000 Yeah. Extra for the we're same we're block size. like 275 to 311 yeah. Like, we're not not $5,000, like a massive no. jump. And now yeah. the investors are like, can we... Sh-? They're still willing to pay, but the owner-occupiers are still buying it up, so... Mm. Now they're finding it hard to even try and get in there, plus it's driving the rents up. So it just goes to show if they're waiting, now they come when it's time to, you know, when it's looking like a better time to buy, they've now paid 30 mm. plus thousand more if they can get that opportunity as well. Mm. Which is pretty hard. Yeah, <laughs> which right. is really hard. Yeah, exactly. Now, mate, um, we touched on it briefly, as did Tom, but the Home Builder Grant, obviously, we've seen that pretty much transform what we do overnight. I think June 8th was when it was released. You know, pr- pre that week, um, it was a lot of, you know, I suppose fear and, and whatnot in the marketplace and not a lot of activity um, from our end anyway, but almost overnight that transformed on the back of the, the, the Home Builder Grant. Do you think, um, you know, what's your take on it? It's obviously been, for us, it's been a very, very positive, you know, thing, but from a townhouse developer, how have you seen that effect? Has it affected, you know, your business too much? Um, and uh, and, uh, and do you see, um, you know, obviously it's been beneficial to the, to the economy, but what's your overall take on the, on the home builder? It's been fantastic. Yeah. Um, I agree. Was it June 8th you mentioned? Mm, I think yeah. early early June I was speaking to my good friends in publicly listed property development companies with residual inventory and they're just sitting there going, mate, we don't have a hope in hell of selling any of this land. Yeah, that's right. What was it? 14 days later they go, I've been in the industry for 20 years. I've never made so many sales <laughs> in my <laughs> yeah, life. Yeah, yeah. I haven't I, slept. I haven't slept and I don't know how to get through all these transactions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so that happened. So that's good because obviously – Every block of land sold mm. needs a house to be built upon it mm. and there's X amount of jobs attached to that. So yeah. that's fantastic. I know industry groups at the moment are lobbying for an extension of yeah. that. Uh, I think we spoke previously going back a month how the banks were the ones caught short because yeah. they weren't using the incentive as funds to complete. Yeah. And mm-hmm. as you know, uh, that's now changed yeah. with, at the very least, Westpac and, and St George. Mm. Yeah, the whole Westpac group accepted it, yeah. 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 Um, how did it affect townhouses? Well, we've we've seen a spike in our in our results as well. Yeah. A couple of reasons there, obviously. If, if there's no land, mm. um, which uh, 
means that uh, we do have inventory. We mm. have registered stock. We have tenanted stock. It's sitting there waiting to transact. So that became quite appealing. Um, and, yeah, I think as you pointed out before, Tom, this is the general amount of activity that's returned to the South East Queensland mm. market that we've all benefited from. And yeah. a lot of people were critical of, you know, um, the government for the home, I suppose the uncertainty around the home builder. And hindsight's great. I mean, we would all love to have, be able to look back and say, well, I wish I would have done that. But at the end of the day, on the June, June 8th, Scott Morrison had so much on his plate and he just had to stimulate the economy. And so people criticising for not having clear details and structures and everything in place. But fuck me, who does managing a country in the middle of a pandemic trying to keep people employed, create jobs and, and just keep food on the table for Australians? So, um, you know, I think I think he's done tremendously well. And I think, I mean, my prediction is, is probably that they will extend it. I don't think they would extend it now because that would then take a lack of urgency off, 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 off using it right now. So people are... They'll probably do it on the last day or a couple of days before the 31st of December and say, well, look, here it is. Keep going, keep ramping forward. But, I mean, regardless if it continues or not, I think the effects of the home builder and the way that it's created will continue to, to see benefits post 31st of December. I think the retail builders who are relying on foot traffic of, of um, you know, people coming through, that may drop, drop off a bit, but I think on the back of that, positivity because you know property prices are all based on consumer confidence and buyer sentiment and all that sort of stuff if people are generally happy and excited and, and optimistic they'll pay more for things if they think everything's going to be sweet right so what's that what this has done i think is just ramped that momentum up and and got got the wheels moving and i think we'll just see that continue to bubble along and increase over over 2021 and yeah, it's yeah, it's sorry, so, you you, it's the it's the component of the economy that's always stimulated. So mm. GFC, I was at Stockland at the time, yeah. and the amount of sales we did was just insane because you had you had the builders providing incentives, and you're talking about retail builders at the yeah. moment, and you drive along the highway, there's certainly plenty of mm. billboards explaining what they'll do for you. You've got banks dropping interest rates. You've got developers giving you, you know, buy a block of land. You're not, not at the moment, but buy a block of land, go and draw to okay. win a Mercedes-Benz yeah. or a $10,000 Meyer voucher. Um, and then you've got the grants. So mm. it is interesting when things go to shit, Hayden, because someone comes out and says property prices are going to do this mm. and it never happens. No. I'm not saying they go through the roof, which they are, but they don't die because no, the no. government, it's the first thing they stimulate. Um, a, because we all own, majority of us own property and we yeah. want to know that the thing that we paid 400 grand for whenever is worth 650 because yeah. it just makes us feel confident. Yeah feel okay we don't want four hundred thousand thing we bought six years ago that's mm. now worth 280 yeah so that gets stimulated that section and that gives us employment it gives us wealth it gives us just morale just morale yeah yeah, yeah yeah and at the moment i know we've we've touched on it in in detail but yeah add to the fact that it's southeast queensland it's warm and you're walking around in a pair of shorts and it's Mate, it's a pretty good uh, time for the industry, I think. And, yeah. and look, make, uh, make no bones about it, South East or Queensland is the real winner Absolutely. in all of this. I mean, anyone who's, you know, this home builder thing has just been like a gift from the gods for, for, for Queensland, not just people in the industry, but homeowners and that, because it, coupled with affordability, there's just literally not a better time that to get yeah. into the market as a first home buyer or owner occupier because you are just getting gifted somewhere between 50 to 60 thousand dollars and and fuck who wouldn't take advantage of that we don't have enough land to keep up yeah that's our problem we've got buyers ready to go we just can't fill them that's yeah that's the, the frustration that that we've got but I, we've i've definitely seen a change in the last couple of months with because we have a quite a strong you know first home buyer presence as well with buyers and the big change that i've noticed is a lot of them are buying the home as an investor but going to live in it for the 12 months or 18 months or 24 mm. months where they've actually really taken that shift to go no, we're not going to customise, we're not going to really push... You know, at the start when the home builders came out, everyone was just spending the 25 grand on extras. Every, you know, we were just seeing the contract and variations come through. Now in the last probably like six weeks, I've really seen the shift where they're just... We're buying this as a home to live in to claim all the grands, but this is really an investment. We're getting we're in. We're really getting We're getting step. in. We're yeah. getting in, we're, we're doing it. This is a window? Yep. And... It's really cha – and I think, you know, and we've brought it up a couple of times before on the podcast, but it's like I think there was a lot of people, wait, you know, woken up when COVID did hit, what money do we actually have? Mm. We've got nothing. And if it – the only thing – the only um, savings we have is in our super. 
that that gets put away automatically, or else we spend everything. What do I actually? Which, have? which, which they've just given me tax access to. Yeah, 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 I've just taken right. out ten grand and bought a boat. Yeah, yeah, yeah good. Jet ski. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and the ones that haven't have pulled that money out put it aside use it as a deposit for a house after a couple of months made a gen mm-hmm. saving so i think there's a there has been that huge shift in the mindset of first home buyers as well going now that there's a lot more information on how to do it in the structures and what you can do that's also been very positive positive. and what the home builders done you mentioned it the land is not there for us yeah. like if i want to build in springfield right now i just cannot do it mm. but with the smart acquisition that you guys have done obviously years and years and years ago when you acquire your, your townhouse developments, you're sitting in a position. Um, are we allowed to talk about that project? Is it released yet or, or not? Oh, I've been speaking about oh, it okay. publicly, yeah. Yeah, uh, cool, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> when you... <laughs> news release, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll pull up the master plan in a second. <laughs> yeah, no, but uh, when you acquire these sites, you're, you're going to be in a really position of power with uh, what Lakeview's Vista. Is mm. it Lake, you know, Lakeside Vista? Lakeside yep. Vista. Whereby there's no registered land in there and you're being able to get a piece of not only, you know, Australia, but a piece of history in such an amazing area for, what, mid-400s? Four, mid um, to be determined, but, yeah, think that, around yeah. about that, yeah. So, I mean, um, in, in somewhere like Springfield. So I think the townhouse side of things will become more and more popular because, again, it's a window to get into the market. Regardless of whether you're an owner, or occupier, or investor, the window is still there because in 12 months' time, prices are going to be significantly different to what they are today. So... If, Springfield, if we identified the magnitude of infrastructure and the amazing and the incredible story that is Springfield and that whole western corridor of of, uh, of Brisbane, and I'm looking at it like, well, look, the house and lands at like six, you know, six hundred mm. now. It's getting up there now, yeah. Fuck, honey, I can four fifty, four sixty for a, this, you know, beautiful townhouse right opposite a lake, right near Bunnings and Masters and GE and you know all this other stuff. Yeah. Makes sense, and, and it's going to rent for four twenty. So five. Oh fuck! How was this? You know, yeah, that's what yeah. I, I'm seeing that as not only Springfield, but your Northern Corridor projects and and uh, and whatnot as well. Like it's just going to make so much sense to get on the ladder at a more affordable price because at the end of the day, people can't afford six hundred. Can't afford six hundred. That's. Uh yeah, that's the plan. That's what we do, and that's what's been working mm. so well lately. And I think you mentioned some things before about uh, tenancies and renting and that kind of thing. And when you're doing that in South East Queensland, you can live where you want. Mm. You were talking about rental yields? Yeah. Um, so you still can rent a fantastic place like what you're talking about. Mm. Um, and you're not in an apartment, no. which is the worst place you'd want to be during COVID mm. in Melbourne or something or Sydney or something like that. So... So, yeah, you can buy these things, which is a fantastic result. You can rent them. They go straight to the top of the rental pool, hey? Yeah. This is what people want. Yeah. There's no elevator to get out of the joint. Yeah, that's right. You've got a backyard. Backyard you can't kick a footy in, but there's hectares and hectares and hectares of the best yeah. open Water public parks. space. Yeah. Yep. All the infrastructure. And I'm not just talking about lakeside vistas. Yeah. This goes into our residential communities on the northern Gold Coast. Yeah. Um, and more affordable options in the Western Corridor. Um, yeah, it, it really is a desirable asset mm. um, to just get in. Yep. Like, and, yeah. that, and that's what we're seeing. They're just coming in. We're going to, where before you'd have to educate them. And a lot of the time, they still, we're still going to push our budget up. You know, let's say it's 500, but we, you know, you should be looking at spending 400. We're going to go to 500 and plus get all the extras as an emotional decision yeah. overextend. Now we're seeing. We're happy with 400. We yep. want to get into the market and start this. We're, they're becoming more educated, which has been really positive to see. What we found with the investors as well is they might have a borrowing capacity in excess of what we're asking for our properties, mm. but they're so comfortable buying our properties because mm. they sleep at night. The rent covers everything. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so it's really filling up a nice part of the market there. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's the old um, – a mentor of mine earlier used to talk about the barrel band uh, in terms of affordability and, and particularly, you know, townhouse stuff. It's like no different. Like I, I want to I buy a house and live in New Farm, but is that realistic for where I am right now? Probably not, you know, so I'm going to look at other options. It's no different to, you know, um, you're comparing a, a house and land package through us in Springfield or a – beautiful you know townhome in springfield it it comes back to affordability and what you're comfortable with and the majority of people are going to sit between that 450 to 550k in southeast queensland as to where they can put their head on the pillow and sleep at night knowing well that's reasonable and that's i'm comfortable with that i'm not overextended so i think certainly um you know you go enjoy the success of that and 
it comes back to a lot. I mean, you can build the best product, even from us. We can build the best house in Australia. But it's that old adage, you know, location, 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 isn't it? And um, so what goes in from, 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 a, from a developer standpoint, you're obviously looking at there's, there's two parts of it. There's the development and, and, the, and the sale uh, or the marketing aspect of, of it's all well and good building and constructing and developing this product but if it doesn't sell it's no good right so you're obviously looking at um you know demographics infrastructure all that sort of stuff to ensure that it's something that's going to be sellable at the end of the day tell us about that sort of process that's actually a really easy process yeah um the growth corridors of southeast queensland mm. have long been established and we have fantastic relationships with the publicly listed property developers. Mm. So they have massive research departments. They know where to put things at the moment, as you know. Yeah. Um, Ripley's on the market. Um, Providence is on yeah. the market. So you've got a whole lot of, you know, the big guys going in there. So that's a lot of the hard work done. If they think it's a yeah. fairly good acquisition, then it doesn't take someone like you or I to sit around and have a couple of beers yeah. and sort of have a discussion yeah. and go... What do you think about Ripley? Yeah. yeah. Mate, what do you think? Mm. Fucking Bunnings have got a site <laughs> and Coles have got a site and, G, you know, all this sort of shit. Population, <laughs> yeah, you know, right. 100,000 in the next nine yeah. years. And, yeah, so, you do, I don't know, I've been doing it forever. So, yeah. I know you haven't been doing it mm. forever, but you seem to have covered a massive amount of ground in, in that less... Mm. Uh, less amount of time so to hear you speak about something like green bank um you know you're way ahead of me on that and you you help me understand those mm. kinds of things but you know you always finish a sentence with it's a no-brainer yeah that's right because whether it's your model where you're putting yourself on the line for 10 blocks of land yeah or whether it's us you know putting our money down mm. to acquire we're just i think we've all been doing it long enough to mm. go yeah yeah people will buy this it's yeah. good yeah. And, and it's the gut feel test, mate. When someone it says, is. and I won't name suburbs because other people do stuff there, but for me it's like, no, I won't do stuff yeah. there because my my curated sales force, um, they, won't, they won't go there. Yeah. And so if they're not going to go there, as you said, if I can't sell it, we're not going to stick it on a stock list. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. You know it works. And the yeah. gut feel thing, like it's funny, you know, like you can look at demographic data and all that sort of stuff. And a lot of the time it just matches or aligns with your gut feel anyway. And that's not to downplay the importance of that demographic, or, you know, demographic data. But I could sit here with spreadsheets and, you know, all the best researchers in, the, in, 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 in Queensland or Brisbane. But at the moment I see Bunnings or the moment I see Coles or the moment I see any of those sort of companies, I'm like, well, they've already out-researched me. Yeah. Now, Bunnings don't make money, for example, on you know, builders like us, they make money on the weekend warriors, the people who decide that they want to build a deck or they want to, you know, redo their garden landscaping. So what comes with that? They need to have population. They need to have people to support that. You look at Springfield, I think it's a 19,000 square metre, what is it, Tommy? 17. 17,000 square metre, you know, superstore in Springfield. Mind you, that was there eight years ago when there was a population of 20,000 people and yet they've got one of the biggest stores in southeast Queensland. So it doesn't take a rocket scientist or a research demographic, yeah, <laughs> demographer to, to understand that there's obviously their research indicates massive population growth to sustain an operation of that size and scale. So, um, you know, from an investor standpoint, you just look at those companies, what they're doing, and follow follow them really. Yeah, throw in a train station yeah. and a couple of schools. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Dub double the size of the shopping centre there. Pretty sure you're. You're under something winner. good, yeah. <laughs> Largest Mate. shopping centre in uh, Southern Hemisphere. So <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, it yeah. is actually, isn't it? Mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it'd be interesting when. I wonder when stage three starts. Obviously, they're waiting to hit a certain threshold. But I also was only speaking to Len Lease the other day at Spring Mountain. That's had a twenty-year, twenty-five-year project that comes to to an end in four years. <laughs> yeah, and they've tried everything to kill it. <laughs> they've tried everything. <laughs> yeah, like as far as price goes, you'll go okay. We'll, we'll increase the prices to dampen demand. Yep. Um, but it can't. People, and it's still a year away. It. It's still a year. Isn't and that funny? And yeah. I, and I always have egg on. Like it's not that I don't believe in it, but it's that the whole mental side of things where you're like, oh fuck, four fifty in Springfield. Mm. And then you're like, oh fuck, five hundred in Springfield. Six fifty. And now we're like <laughs> fucking six fifty in Springfield. It's, it's like, just, when yeah. does it stop? But it a doesn't. million bucks in Augustine Heights. Yeah, One point four at Brookwater. You know. Um, 
And then, and then, as you know, I released and sold out of Eden Brook Villas, two kilometres from um, Brookwater. Yeah, like there's a Mount Juliet Road. Yeah, will continue yeah. through there. You, you could walk your dog from Eden Brook Villas to Brookwater. Yeah. three hundred thirty-seven thousand dollars townhouses. Crazy, mate. There's a train station because uh, it would go Kessels, uh, Kedges, Kedges Road, yeah. and then into Eden Brook Villas. And then, as you said, they're about to build a, a Woolworth. So someone's just paid three hundred thirty-seven thousand to get three hundred forty dollars a week rent. And uh, the capital growth, growth drivers aren't even there yet. Yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> it's already hot paying for what it's like, what it costs you. And so you're yes. buying, like you're buying there, and you've, as you said, you've got a train line, so much infrastructure to support, again, population growth that's forecasted in that that whole that whole area. And you look at the established capital benchmark, which is what I look at a lot when I when I purchase mine. Mm. I'm like, okay, well, I want to be buying nearby to expensive places. So if I look mm. at you know, um, you know that that Western Corridor. And I look, okay, Brookwater's a million bucks, Augustine Heights eight hundred, Springfield six fifty, and I'm and I'm two minutes down the road for three thirty. It sort of yeah. it almost buys itself. <laughs> Ultimately, why you probably had no struggle there in, in in moving them because it just again from a from someone interstate, they're looking at that. You're telling me that I'm near the largest shopping center in the Southern Hemisphere, a one point seven billion dollar train line development. All this other stuff, seventh largest company in the world, etc., 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 and I'm paying three hundred and thirty thousand. Like, you know, is that the deposit? Like, that's yeah. the sort of thing you'd expect in Sydney, right? So, with the grants and everything available, your own cash you don't really need with the grants that are available. Yeah. Well, to complete, you can just buy it as a first home buyer with no money down. Well, and a lot of the superannuation funds. Mm. Yeah. Oh, you pull out twenty, you've actually got extra money left. You'll have money left over from that purchase. Well, I'll tell you one thing: when the share market dropped thirty percent overnight. Those townhouses were still worth three, you know, three forty. That's, that's it, and uh, yeah, fortunately, our pipeline will be replacing that inventory mm. not too far from that location with another hundred and eighty of those. Yeah, nice. Uh, which is coming after that lakeside vista. Yeah, great. Yeah, and so mate, with townhouses, um, obviously, you know, with with house and land, uh, it's freehold. Um, yep. Whereby you know you take control of, of your land, you own the land, and uh, and you, you do your rates and all that sort of stuff. It's a new. Um, it's a new topic that we're introducing today so it'd be good to get sort of a background as as to a townhouse the actual construction you know of them uh in relation to w- you know what's their makeup you know uh, adjoining walls all that sort of stuff mm. but also explain the term or, or, or introduce body corporate systems and, yep. and what that is so we buy a site and then we have a look at the highest and best use for that site so mm. we put our dwellings together in either duplexes, triplexes or fours, mm. just depending, and then we put them on um, as best they fit. We don't go overboard with the sites. We make sure that they're livable sites mm. with um, wide verges. We take the um, traffic off the street. We provide parking for that. Once we've done that, basically our, our better designs that, we, that we're really proud of have a single lock-up garage but a secondary uh, living area upstairs, right. which has been really popular. That's the dwelling. Um, that's great. The body corporate side of things, when I first, all through my real estate career, I hated selling anything with a body mm. corporate. Um, so then when we started getting involved with a body corporate, my my immediate desire was to have like something like a $12 body corporate. Mm. As we worked through the process, um, I was educated to what we now do, which is a building format plan. It's a $50 body corporate, and without going into too much detail, it just makes it a set-and-forget investment. There's no arguments between the body corporate and other tenants or, sorry, other owners, Mm. anything like that. And the reality is the presentation of the residential community over time actually increases. Mm. So when you buy it at the start, you go, wow, that looks beautiful, but you go back four years later, which is something I really like doing in my property Mm. development career, like, having a look at things that I remember walking through a paddock <laughs> and then later Dodging on. Dodging brown snakes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yep, do plenty of that. Um, so that's how the body corp works. So yep. from an investor's point of view, it is set and forget, Hayden. Mm. You walk in, you get a good property, it ticks all the boxes. You've got on-site management. Mm. So with on-site management, uh, that's a massive benefit that is, to be honest, poorly understood in Sydney and Melbourne mm. because it's not it's not common. But essentially we sell the management rights to typically a couple, husband and wife. They pay for a dwelling and they pay for the business. And then what they want to do is they want to add value to that business and sell it at some stage down mm. down the track. How they do that 
is they incrementally and responsibly increase rents, they minimise vacancy and they make sure you have fantastic tenants. Mm. They want fantastic tenants because they're living in the same complex. Mm. Yep. So they'll live in a – so they'll you know, say you've got 80 units, they'll buy unit one, live – and work and manage the whole complex. Yeah, we'll actually build a standalone purpose-built house for them. Right. Yeah. So that would become, say, Unit 1, mm. um, which is their home, but it's also uh, also their office. So that's a little bit of a game-changer, really, because if you look back at, you know, it's, you know you obviously got uh, what are they called, bylaws or whatever they're called in apartment projects and whatnot, but there's no one really normally to enforce any sort of um, you know, following of that those rules and, and any repercussions because there's no one there seeing it, living it and, and, and working on it, I suppose. So having a on-site manager is that person there that's really going, as you said, they live there. So they want to make sure that they don't have, you know, doofs at, uh, at three in the morning or, you know, a grow house in the, in the ceiling, you know, or whatever it may be. Um, and, of course, from an investor's standpoint, you, you must be thinking, again, if you're buying a $330,000 townhouse and you say, well, my, my property manager's going to live next door? Mm. Well, how good's this? Well, let's talk about property managers. Mm. So our on-site managers are probably around about a million dollars in Yep, because they bought a dwelling for about half a million and business for about the same. Yep. Um, my property managers are typically 17 to 18 years old mm. that have never – my personal property managers mm. – um, that have never bought a property and – they can't really add value to what I'm doing. They can collect rent and that's pretty much what they do. Mm. So, yeah, you're right with what you said. Going back only, I think it was a couple of weekends ago, one of the tenants thought it might be good to have a bit of a party and disrupt the whole residential community and they get noticed. They get issued with a notice to um, leave. One, mm. one strike, that's it, you're gone. And well, that's, yeah, that's good because it's not hearsay. A lot of the time it's you know, a war of words between the tenant, the property manager and the owner, but... Mate, you woke me up at three in the morning. Yeah. I fucking heard it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I heard locomotion going off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the others living in this will stay there long term because they know the place is getting looked after and managed. If yeah. they know that there's quality tenants always coming through and their kids or whatever stage in life they're in, it's always going to be maintained or else they'll get kicked out. And it, they honestly, typically the wife looks after the property management type of uh, side of the business mm. and the husband looks after the maintenance and they are extremely proud of the presentation mm, of the yeah. residential community and the tenant pool. When we release these things to the market for rent, because we do it stage by stage as yeah. they settle, um, as I said before, they go straight to the top of the wish list. And regardless of the circumstances, even a few months ago when it was like, oh, you're not going to be able to get tenants and there's mm. all these problems, we were oversubscribed and always have been. Yeah, well. um, and that allows us to obviously match the uh, better tenant with, the, um, with our, yeah. with our investors. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And so with your body corporate, so what sort of um, uh, communal sort of, um, you know, what's the word, things, uh, you know, pools, that sort of stuff, what yep. have you got? So there's a body corporate, does that include some sort of, you know, um, communal... Yeah, so we've got um, always got a pool. Oh, right, okay. Uh, Warwick Terrace has had two pools. Yep. Um, yeah, always got a pool, always got public open space, always got uh, shelter, barbecue facilities, all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, but again, on top of those, which are, which are very high-class facilities, we're always girt by... Yeah, M master industry. plan to stay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. yeah. So we've... They're very, very comfortable places to live. And so that would obviously, I mean, if, you, if you're if you comparing again, for the sake of, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, because maybe exposure to, to this isn't great, but if I'm looking at option A, which is an MG townhouse, a quality dwelling itself, but then you've got a pool and a barbecue and a bit of you know communal space, or you've got you know option B, which is XYZ, you know, townhouse developments, and you don't have any of that sort of stuff, You'd be obviously, you know, it makes sense to me that there'd be a massive demand and, and gravitation towards that. So if you had to pay a little bit higher body corporate as an investor, but you know that that's probably going to be offset by an increased rent, but also an increased risk or a, a mitigated risk because there's a larger proportion of the population that's going to prefer that product over that product, obviously that would make sense. The set and forget. It's all done. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And the cost associated, as you know, with the body corporate, once you put that through a PIA, mm. nine times out of ten, you still remain cash yeah. flow positive. Yeah. 
Because your price point's cheaper as well, you know. Like, if, it's not as if it's, you know, 50 bucks a week on a, a additional to a, you know, 350k mortgage isn't going to break the world considering your yield's higher than, you know, sounds like I'm downgrading buying houses, which I'm not <laughs> I'm not doing, but I, I think it's a, a great alternative as well if you can't get into that. To, oh, into absolutely. That and a lot of my partners, as you know, mm. um, they prioritise house and land, and when that's not an option, then they refer me in for, mm. um, to provide a townhouse opportunity. Mm. And, mate, you mentioned quickly self-managed super funds, a mm. great little set and forget for, for those um, – uh, for those funds out there and I think you know Australia's got a love affair with property I mean everyone anyone you speak to has an opinion on property which sometimes can be annoying um, but in saying that what we've seen uh, what I've certainly seen whilst we don't do any of the one part or self-managed super fund stock it's certainly requested a lot which would I would I would assume and you'll probably be able to have some more uh, real data or, 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 or um, real life um, sort of feel on it but I get the sense that Australians are looking at self-managed super funds closer than ever to negate the risk or the uncertainty in the share and stock market or the volatility, I suppose, that, that they've experienced over COVID-19 with the, the ebbs and flows and the, and the peaks and troughs and, and they're just sort of wanting that set to forget. Have you seen a, a real shift in the SMS F space to your product? Well, as discussed six years ago, we moved out of house and land mm. and we started developing one part contract. Um, and you remember six years ago, yeah, yeah. so that was self-managed super funds were kicking off then. It's a, I mean, they've always been there. Yeah. Back when I was an accountant, when I was 17, you still, those clients were still buying property in self-managed yep. super funds. Um, but I think our part of the industry finally worked it out. Um, so it's been popular since then, but it's changed and improved and been set back mm. and it's been... It's been a little bit of a nightmare. Lending change. I mean, lending yeah. a couple of years ago was oh. all over the place. For and it. then you needed these cash buffers and then legislation changed mm. all over the place. Having said all that, if you say to the average Australian, particularly as they get closer and closer to retirement, mm. and particularly now, like my parents are in their 70s and they're like, you know, my soup has gone down by this. Yeah. And my monthly, whatever they get, pension from it or whatever, because they can't quite explain it to me. <laughs> they say we're getting less and people freak out, like we said before, about uh, stimulating the housing market mm. so people feel confident, and I think you use the word morale. Yeah. The opposite happens if they've got a million bucks in super that becomes, I think you said, the 30% mm. uh, reduction overnight. That just has an effect on them, particularly if they're yeah. older. So if they have a choice... Um, yeah, I feel they'd like to go into property and I feel as though legislation prevents them from doing that ag as aggressively mm. as they, they would. Be. Yeah. And because, I mean, realistically, like, you know, I'm not saying shares are, are a bad, you know, investment or whatever. Me and Tommy are killing we're, it. At we're, the we're, <laughs> we're experts <laughs> recently. Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> but no, but um, what it does, like in the, in the situation of, of your parents or someone who's 60 or 63 or about to retire... They don't have the time to make up that 30%. They've, mm. they've got to either work, keep working, or take the loss. Whereas for me, if my super drops 30% overnight, whatever, it's yeah. you know, 40 years down the track that I have to worry about that, we'll just keep rolling with it and it'll continue to grow. But the volatility in terms of like, it can change your world overnight based on your age and where you are and set to re you know, when you're set to retire. It's, um, it's certainly for me, you know, if I was you know, in the situation at, at 65, I'd be a lot more comfortable in having my uh, my money, my retirement fund in, in bricks and mortar, even if it meant that I had to sell it one day or whatever, sell mm. it in a couple of years. I'd, I'd rather have it there as a, as we keep using the phrase, but set and forget and know that it's, you know, no matter what happens in 12 months, mm. the World War Three could erupt and, uh, you know, that's still, well, hopefully it's going to still be standing there. <laughs> but, uh, You've got control of yeah, your that's own, right. own retirement. I think where you're getting, like you said, their actual incomes dropped. Well, if you had properties in places paying your rent, mm. And most people paid rent through COVID. It was very rare that that didn't happen. Yeah. And there was unique circumstances. Their their rents actually going to increase over that lifespan of the property usually, and the more you know, and the property being paid off, they're they're, they're not going to drop all of a sudden. You're not going to have your incomes that you live every day to pay for groceries. Mm. You're going to have that money coming through. So it's you know frustrating to see these people that have relied on their super and now their weekly, you know, especially when they've got building that that bills and they budgeted. Now they actually can't afford some things they normally can if they've had a huge drop in their super. They just don't understand it. 
Yeah. Mm. I, I made the mm. point, my parents can't explain how they've structured their retirement to me because <laughs> yeah. they don't understand it. Mm. Whereas if you talk to somebody, as you said, and you said it's frustrating, Hayden, but that's the reality. You can go anywhere, anytime in Australia and have a conversation with someone about property and they're an expert mm. before you even tell them what you do for yeah, a living because right. you, yeah. you, you just end up going, yeah. Oh, sometimes you like don't even bother like, oh, mate, oh, I'm just a tradie or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. You don't even want to get involved in the conversation. Yeah. Mate, I'm a poet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like, oh, okay. I'm a bush poet. <laughs> <laughs> but they know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whether they're right or wrong, mate, they understand property. Yeah. You talk to them about the share market and they just... Yeah, I don't get it. I'm like that, mate. You know, like I, I chat the time, like, fuck, I have no idea. You know, no idea what's going on in the share market. Mm. But ask me about property. I have probably have no idea, but <laughs> but I'll tell you. You know, so yeah. uh, <laughs> so certainly, um, certainly something to to consider there for for people watching anyway to to to, to maybe get an understanding. I would say of, of where you're actually at financially, and mm. before you know it, you know, I look at my mum as a prime example. She was just meandering through life. It hadn't I mean, with no disrespect, she was doing well and you know living yep. a life yeah. and whatever. But in terms of investing in property, she gets to you know a certain age, you know forty or whatever, and she's got nothing to show for it. You know, she's got. And I'm looking. You know, I'm just entering in the property market. This is you know ten years ago or property industry. And I'm like, I'm I'm, I'm looking at you know, I'm uh, circulating with people who are you know talking about PIAs and retirement plans and that sort of stuff. I'm like, mum, you. How are you gonna? You've got hundred grand in your super. What you're gonna work till the day you die? You're fucked, essentially. Yep. Like you're in some serious trouble. Being a single woman uh, at the time, you know, with with no nest egg, no property, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So anyway, fast forward, 2011, she buys a house for three hundred eleven thousand five hundred dollars. Her biggest achievement, apart from me, of course. Um, uh, <laughs> and your and then, no, the house there, my brother. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that property now values it like five hundred grand. So yep. she's looking at it, looking at it now, like okay, she's just about to turn fifty, but she's now got you know she, her mortgage is only two hundred, but all of a sudden she's got you know equity of you know three four hundred grand sitting there like fuck, how did that come to be? Mm. Yeah. When she's and still got what one hundred and twenty in super. Yeah, and she's still got one hundred and twenty <laughs> in super. You know, and so. <laughs> Chatting to someone, I mean, she was lucky because we she did it, you know, uh, off the bat and just bought an owner-occupied house that s- luckily was in a good area and without any sort of idea and I just planted the seed with her. But um, if you're in that same situation, I would certainly recommend getting the advice of, of the people that me and you deal with and Absolutely. Tommy to introduce yep. us and, and sort of get an understanding. It doesn't mean you have to buy a property, but get mm. an understanding of what, when you get to age 65, what is it going to be look, look like? Because I tell you, Living on the pension, pr- providing it's even available, is not glamorous. It's not something to be proud of. It's a hard life. I, I think you qualify at 70 as well. Yeah, there you go. You know, like, I've got three years left in me for work and max. You know, <laughs> I, I need to do something. <laughs> I think the big thing is, like you said, she got to 40, 45, and she didn't know what to do. Yeah. And no one in mm. her life, you know, family before her may have made those decisions either, so you don't know. I remember when I was, like, 15 and I was... Grew up in a very, I guess, housing commission sort of situation with my um, mother. And I just remember asking her, like, why do we live like this? She says, this is just who we are. And I'm like, hang on, why do we actually live like this? I don't know, this is how my parents lived. And I'm like, you're 40 years old at the time. Like, why don't you just change the way? And that's what really gave me the option. Okay, I just need to do things differently. And what people have got the information, the experts out there now, with especially on Google, you can research people and actually go and find out what can you do to turn your life around. Even at 45... Or forty, she's drastic. If she didn't make that decision, ten years would have gone by, and she would have had one hundred and thirty in her account and still paying rent. Mm. Now she's generated all this wealth by just you going to get a job somewhere. Going, there's actually another way, mum. Yeah, that's right. Mm. And that's how big it is. What you know, a lot of people don't know. And now there's heaps of experts just with Google that you can go in your local area to actually speak mm. to speak to people that can give you a different result. The saddest thing, and we all hear it, is no one ever told me, and mm. I wish I had started I this had earlier. Yeah. yeah. Because once you understand compound interest and you mm. go, God, I started at 40, I could have started at, uh, you started at 22. Yeah, yeah, 21, yeah. 21? Yeah, time. It's and a big time, thing. Yeah. Time, yeah. The biggest asset people have is time. You know, I'm looking down the barrel of, you know, it, it being 25, 25, yeah. And, like, in five years' time, it's not unrealistic to have a property portfolio worth millions of dollars by the time I'm 30, which if I didn't want to work... I wouldn't necessarily have to work as an option. Same with Tom and obviously yourself as well. And, I mean, you changed both of our worlds last um, – uh, like we met a couple of uh, months ago when you said, you know, we're already retired and that's the mindset I have now because mm. what would I rather be doing than what I'm doing now? Even if I could 
you know. So that that changed the mindset. But for people out there, they don't they don't necessarily have that that um, luxury of of loving what they do every day. So if you have the opportunity to retire and and enjoy what's left of your life at 65, 70, then you need to get get your ass in the gear and make make some change to to do that. But mate, uh, lastly, we've got to start to wrap it up. But um, Responsible lending laws, we touched on it mm. just before. I mean, a game changer. So I think the, were they were brought in uh, 2010-ish, weren't they? Uh, Responsible lending laws? Responsible lending yeah. laws. No, only a couple of years oh, ago. Oh, right, okay. Yeah, yeah. So this is part of all the Royal Commission and yeah, all right. that kind of thing. So so two years ago, um, I just came out of a fixed period on my portfolio. Mm-hmm. So I rang my broker, one of my best mates, and said, hey, dude, just doing this. He goes, yeah, no worries. Here's a sheet of paper. Just fill it out and I'll get it all done for you. Yeah. And then he came back and said, mate, I really got to apologise for this. I don't know what's going on. You have to speak to Commonwealth Bank directly and a gentleman's going to speak to you. So this is a true story going back four weeks ago, right? Yeah, right. This guy four, rings. Yeah. Just four weeks ago or two four. years ago? No, so two, two years ago, responsible lending okay, came in. Right? Yeah. So basically what happened is what, yep. what our guys do is promote interest-only loans yeah. and then yep. anyway, that'll yep. happen. Yep. Um, so old mate Commonwealth Bank rings me and he goes, oh, you've been a client for 25 years. Oh, you've established a property portfolio over 17 years. Anyway, uh, for the next 45 minutes, I'm going to ask you a series of questions. I'm like, mate, why? What is going on? Yeah, right. He goes, we've introduced this legislation two years ago. Your broker should have told you about it. And they then asked me, and I knew a little bit about this from our introducers, that they were getting asked a couple of questions <coughs> about their Netflix and mm. takeaway. That's all I knew. And I said, okay, we're going to go through that. He went through everything. He mentioned BWS. <laughs> Weekly. Daily. <laughs> Daily. <laughs> he mentioned Chemist Warehouse. He wanted to know my relationship with Chemist Warehouse. Takeaway food, all this stuff. It was it was incredible. Wow. I, I just scraped through and, go, and managed to keep my loans. Managed to keep them? Well, this was the thing. It's like if you want to switch to interest only, I'm like, mate, I've been on interest only for 12 years. But long story short, that's what I had to go through. To say what? Considering yeah. where I am in my property journey at 48 years of age, and then you think about some of our introducers trying to get loans for people yeah, you know their, their first investment or their first property or whatever the case may be that's a direct example of responsible lending they mm. the banks just got caned by the royal commission so they cover their ass by doing that overkill N- now app yeah overkill now app and this is why your subject to finance 28 days mm. is ridiculous it's you know it's got to go on forever and ever with heaps of extensions yeah. and whatever the case may be so then APRA has come out recently i think it was last week or the week before and just said look we're going to repeal those responsible lending laws mm. um, which is just sensible if somebody feel we're all hypersensitized to our household budgets and to being able to sleep at night and if we feel reasonably confident that we can go in and we're going to pay a deposit we're going to take on a 30-year loan you know, we've sat and husband and wife have looked at each other and said, yeah, we can do this. Then we're going to get an interest rate at two point bugger all, but they're going mm. to assess us at five, six, seven percent. That's enough. Fill out the form. Let's get on with it. Mm. Uh, yeah. So that's where, has to be that's responsibility where we're at. on the applicants actually doing the loan. That's yeah. See, on, on the back of that, on the back of like, I mean, if I look back at every transaction I've done since in the last two years and I think about how many deals were lost due to these laws and, and just time frames and, and just people being like, oh, fuck, this is way too hard. Mate, it was so hard. And and my mate's the broker. Mm. And I'm going, what do I need you for? And he goes, I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, right. Because then now asking me for my source documents. I'm going, you've got the source yeah. documents. They go, yeah, but they came from your broker. They've got to come from you. So I'm uh, three yeah. months of bank statements. <laughs> have you got your last... Rental slip. Have you, I'm like, dude, I don't do this because mm. I've got a broker that does this. And he goes, yeah, but we need it from you. So I stayed calm and got through it, but too hard. Too hard. And, you know, if you put those people in back into the buying pool who, you know, or just have access to it and are comfortable because a lot of people want to buy a property, but the banks make it so hard mm. to buy a property. Again, you're talking about a massive amount of transactions add into the amount of property sold and, and, and developed in that each week, you know, it, it really is shaping up to be, you know, almost the perfect storm of, 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 of properties, you know, in terms of property cycles, specifically here in, in South East Queensland. I think we're front and centre of, you know, the next wave of, of, of growth. 
you mentioned you had uh, John mm. in here. And he... James, his nephew. Oh, James, yeah. okay. And he gave you some information regarding what happened after yeah. certain mm. uh, economic events. Well, you think about World War Two, and what happened after that. T- tell us. I well, that was, that's what created the baby boomers. Yeah, right. And so they're the guys cruising around the port houses for five bucks that are now mm. worth, you know, heaps, and they're driving around in Winnebago's with a, <laughs> with a sign on the back saying, I spent the kids' inheritance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I agree. I think after any bust, there's a boom, mm. and it should be roughly commensurate. So if it's a pretty bad one, then it's a pretty big boom. Big boom, yeah. Yeah, and I think coupled with the stuff that we've talked about ad nauseum this morning, um, South East Queensland particularly is going to benefit f- yeah. from that and that's going to have a mm. lot to do with interstate migration. Yeah. Absolutely. And just the why wouldn't you factor. Mm. Yeah. AFL right now are up here and they're just going, mate, how long has this been going on for? Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, right. that's right. And why has no one told teams? us about this? Yeah, <laughs> and everyone's going, can I play for the Lions? Can I yeah. play for the Suns? Which would you prefer? Yeah. Oh, I don't care. Mm. <laughs> are you an AFL supporter? <laughs> Who do you got? Brit- Lions played along this weekend. Well, you know, and then you've got, you've got Richmond versus uh, Port Adelaide. Port Adelaide. Yeah. Well, what's your, what's your take? What, what do you think? Because this is going to be released next mm. Wednesday. So you, you're After, gonna, yeah. I'm a fan of making a tip and yeah. not sitting on the fence. So Port Adelaide will do it uh, on their home ground. You reckon? You're yeah, right. I do. And um, oh, just what I saw from Geelong last weekend was With insane. Yeah. yeah. But I'm hoping they played their grand final last week. Mm. And Tough to be the case. Yeah, so... It'd be good to see the Lions versus that Port Adelaide oh. again, you know, 2001, two and three. I think they went back to back, didn't they? Four? So they played three or four. Yeah, and the Lions straight. beat them... Yeah, yeah, and I think those four years, Port Adelaide finished top of the ladder mm. and only got one premiership out of it. But uh, but yeah, anyway, it's going to be it's going to be a fantastic weekend, yeah. mate. And yeah. um, it's certainly, I mean, you know, highlighted uh, you know how good Queensland is uh, and 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 safe, I suppose we are. And I mean, this whole COVID thing's been the best tourism ad for Queensland, mm. you know, possibly even Queensland as a realizing how good Queensland is. Well, they're all going on holidays. Yeah, that's all right. the guys, all, everyone in Brisbane, it, you know, a lot of people on the Brisbane mm. Gold Coast. I see they're all up in Cairns and mm. with Sundays yeah. and doing all these holidays. Going, how great is this? And everyone's like, where are you? It's like mm. these places have always existed. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Paul, mate, um, got to wrap it up. But really appreciate you mm. coming on, Paul Thanks Bloomfield, coming, Paul. sales manager of MG Homes. Thank you very much for watching. Anyone who wants to get in contact with you, Paul, what's the best way? Uh, yeah, you can get me on 0439486242 or uh, check me out on LinkedIn. Yeah, perfect. Uh, and, I'm, of course, you've got a website, mghomes.com.au, something like that as well. Yep. Yeah, perfect. All right, so, uh, Paul, thank you very much for coming in. If you are after um, some affordable price point townhouse stock in, in some really solid locations, I couldn't recommend Paul and his team at MG Homes enough. Um, terrific developers uh, built uh, you know, sold and built a lot of them myself and, uh, and and Tom has as well. So can't recommend him enough. Uh, thank you so much for watching Everything Property by Pivotal Homes. Please remember to click the like button, share, subscribe, all that sort of stuff. But until next time, we will see you later. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys.